Okay, so good afternoon to everybody. I'm uh, very happy to welcome today Stephen Cecchetti that uh, will present uh, uh, an advisory scientific committee uh, European Systemic Risk Board report on stabilizing financial markets, lending and market making as a last resort. That is uh, a report that he developed with uh, William Booter, uh, Catherine Dominguez and Antonio uh, Sanchez Serrano. Uh, and uh, on top of his presentation, we will have also uh, the comments from uh, Frank Keane from the Federal Reserve Board of New York and Daryl Duffy from uh, Stanford University. So let me just introduce Stephen, uh, that is uh, a chair, uh, that is a professor in international finance at Brandeis International Business School. Uh, he is also co-chair with me at the Advisory Scientific Committee together with uh, Javier uh, Juarez. Uh, and uh, he was also, from 2008 to 2013, economic advisor and head of the monetary and economic department at the Bank for International Settlement. Uh, and on top of this, before he was also executive vice president and director of research at the Federal Reserve uh, of New Bank of New York. Um, I'm not going to spend other time, uh, but uh, I think that uh, it will be important that I'm providing some information on how we are organizing this seminar. So there will be a presentation of, uh, uh, of the reports by uh, Steve with about uh, around 20 minutes, even less. Then there will be some comment by Frank and eventually Daryl. And then we are leaving time for uh, Q&A. So we want really to have a section that is uh, uh, quite, let's say, um, uh, with a lot of discussion on this topic that we think is extremely important. So, Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for all of you to participate. Okay, yes? thank you. Thank you very much, Loriana, for the invitation. Um, and uh, welcome to all of my, uh, I saw the list of participants and and, uh, and let me take the opportunity to welcome a lot of old friends and, uh, and colleagues. Um, thank you very much for joining. Um, as Loriana pointed out, this is a report for the Advisory Scientific Committee of the European Systemic Risk Board. It was published last month. Um, and, uh, and I will try and summarize the salient points. I won't get to everything. The, but let me just start with this, which is not directly in the report. This came, this occurred during the period of the, when the report was in, in its final uh, production. Uh, and as, as many, uh, I'm sure all of the people on this, in this seminar know in October, the Bank of England uh, intervened heavily in the gilt market in order to, uh, to essentially stem fire sales that were coming from, uh, from some particular structures that had been uh, the these limited uh, the, the, that had been created to uh, to help pension funds match their uh, match their maturity of their assets and their liabilities. This was a at the time thought to have been a fairly big uh, intervention, um, and it was temporary, um, and it seems to have worked. Um, I could have some complaints about various small things about it, but the fact is that they did it, um, and. Uh, this was just one in many things that occurred. During the pandemic, there were a huge number of central bank interventions. And this is what really got us uh, going on, um, on this report. The, the, in addition to the standard monetary policy interventions, uh, this is a survey from the BIS uh, that was done in 2021. There were, um, there were a large number of interest rate changes. Um, there were a lot of reserve remuneration rate changes. But in addition, there were lending support operations, exchange rate policies, and asset purchase operations. And these things were, um, there were just an enormous, an enormous number of these that occurred all around the world. Um, and the objective of these was to restore uh, credit to firms, households, and governments at some level, but, it, but it, importantly, to restore the functioning of systemically important markets. And um, as we try and emphasize in the report also, uh, without functioning financial markets, the monetary, po monetary policy sort of doesn't exist. This is, a, this is something that, that, that leaves open uh, intervention, I think, in financial markets by central banks that have 
rather narrower mandates, but most central banks also have financial stability mandates uh, these days. And so I think that maintaining financial stability is something that is essential without financial stability, um, without a f functioning financial system and financial markets, you don't have uh, support of a real economy. So this is why this is going on. Now, um, let, me, let me also point out that, um, that over the period of the pandemic, these programs extended well beyond where they had been uh, previously. These, this particular slide, we list five programs, or I listed five programs that um, that were focused on the purchase of corporate bonds. So these are these are programs that in which the the central banks that had historically limited their purchases to uh, to public sector sovereign securities shifted. To, uh, to purchasing and holding corporate sector securities. Now, in some cases, this was not done, done directly by the, by the central bank. The Federal Reserve is not allowed to own these things directly, so they do it through uh, captive, uh, captive entities, special purpose vehicles of various kinds. Now, what I want to emphasize on this is that they were purchasing, um, purchasing a wide array of these, a large number of bonds from a very large number of issuers, and the amounts were not uh, insubstantial. Um, and the limits that were in place uh, were quite high in most cases. The biggest of these, the one that really that really stands out, is obviously the euro system at the top. In the case of the U.S., um, the fourteen billion dollars doesn't look very big, and it isn't, um, especially given the size of the market, uh, which is in the far right column. Um, now, importantly, as we think about central bank balance sheets, central banks use balance sheets for many reasons. Um, this is a listing of, a, of seven reasons why they might use them. They overlap clearly, but we're used to aggregate demand management policies, which is how we think about central banks, at least in their, um, in their stabilization, macroeconomic stabilization objectives. So if a, if a central bank is trying to target inflation, it's about demand management. But in addition, uh, central banks do all sorts of other things. They provide so selective credit support, something which some people may not agree with, but they do it. Uh, they provide emergency government finance, often not a very good idea, but again, central banks do that. They do exchange rate management of various kinds, depending on their mandate. But then in addition, they do collateralized lending to solvent but illiquid firms, that's lender of last resort operations, and outright purchases to address liquidity needs in markets. They're a market maker of last resort operations, sometimes referred to as buyer of last resort. But we think that the uh, we we, we um, discuss this and think this is a the more commonly used term, and so we stuck with it. Um, and then uh, finally, there's lending of national currency to other central bank through uh, through various international operations. Our focus here is uh, is obviously on the on the two, uh, the lender and the market maker of last resort, uh, lending in national currency forms a part of this, but is not a major, uh, a major part of what we discuss. Um, now, the, the, the reason I bring all of these up is that there are multiple purposes that central banks use their uh, to which they put their balance sheets and that these can shift over time. So the primary example, especially for someone who lived through this in the United States is the treasury's actions where the treasury purchase the I'm sorry the, the Federal Reserve's actions in the Treasury market at the beginning of the pandemic the the treasury the Fed purchased um, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of uh, treasuries in March of April of 2020 with the with the objective of stabilizing the um, the treasury market we could discuss whether or not they needed to purchase so purchase that much um, but that's not the point there was certainly a need to do something because the the market the treasury market revealed itself to be fragile um, obviously there are, we might we could obviously take action and, and Daryl Duffy has suggested ways that we might uh, that we might improve the, the the quality of the market so that we don't have to do this but that particular action then um, evolved or shifted into uh, really aggregate demand stimulus. Nobody would claim that by the um, by the middle of 2020, that this was a market stabilization action. At that point, the Federal Reserve was doing something else. It was, it was doing a form of what has typically been called quantitative easing, but in this case, I would call it aggregate demand stimulus or management. Um, the Bank of England's 
programs have shifted over time. The Euro Systems PEP program, the pandemic um, intervention program, had a number of different possible, uh, you, you could assign it a number of different possible objectives. Um, ETF purchases by the Bank of Japan and by the the Fed also shifted in their in their purposes. So, so the point here is that there are many uses and that they shift over time. I think it's important that central banks actually tell you what they're doing. Um, but again, that's a different issue. Now, um, going going back to um, a few examples, um, this is a list. I don't expect to go through all of this, or it's in the the details are in the report. I just want to show you that these are the number of programs that were in place. Uh, in the euro system during the pandemic and um, or or at some point uh, leading up to the pandemic that were various balance sheet programs. They had, uh, some of them were very large, some of them were quite small. Um, they all had various objectives. We try to categorize them here. Um, the lender, a number of them were lender of last resort objectives, and we would categorize a number of them as market maker of last resort objectives as well. Uh, we include in here things like this transmission protection instrument, which um, has uh, has not been used uh, yet, um, but may be used. Um, we have out, out, outright monetary transactions. That was the famous program associated with the uh, with, with the whatever it takes statement of Mario Draghi, and there was never any use of that of that either. Similarly, uh, there are a lot of programs that the Federal Reserve put into place. Again, I don't want to talk about them all. All I want to do is just point out that some of them were very large. Uh, some of them were related to uh, to trying to stabilize. Um, to stabilize markets and to stabilize market makers, um, and you can you can see the uh, the second and the columns under function. You can see that we would categorize a number of those in in uh, in those uh, in that way. And if you look, the peak use of some of these um, was really uh, was was again quite high. Uh, the biggest is is still the central bank liquidity swap program, which peaked in in the during the the financial crisis, um, but um, but more recently there have been uh, repo facilities and the like that were put in place um, in in the pandemic. Okay, so why are central banks in, intervening into markets? Let me just say um, I should say stop and just say that um, that we don't question um, whether this is a necessarily a good idea. We we although um, I, I do agree that in many of these cases I think it was probably a good idea, but the, the thrust of the report is to uh, is to start from the premise that central banks are going to do these things and then ask what the best way is to do them. So the rationale for these pro programs then is to address market um, malfunctions when when markets become illiquid uh, and, the, and and they may disappear. Now, the cause of this, uh, it could be a number of things. Uh, among them, or prime among them, is the concern over the quality of counterparties. Uh, that's a pretty big one. People don't want to don't don't want to enter into arrangements with people that they don't trust. Um, and if uh, if the trustworthiness of counterparties uh, is uh, is comes into question, then the willingness to trade with them will come into question, and the market could disappear. Uh, the quality of securities themselves could come into question. Uh, this is an issue that has been studied, uh, I think, quite well and discussed by uh, by Gary Gordon and, and Banked Holstrom when they talk about the fact that securities that used that were information insensitive could suddenly become information sensitive. At which point, the people that were holding them might not have the capacity to actually uh, evaluate the creditworthiness of the securities, and in that case, markets could also disappear. And so, the outcome here is that private sector market makers withdraw, and typical typical market participants can uh, can vanish. Now, central banks then intervene um, with the operational objective of returning liquidity to markets and then ensuring that funding um, occurs. The, um, they can catalyze market making in two ways uh, that are very distinct. Uh, one of them is to provide lending to private agents who can then purchase and hold the securities. In, in fact, simply offering to, uh, to lend against securities could in and of itself bring markets back because people, people could say, oh, well, I'll be able to finance these through the central bank if I absolutely have to. A second possibility 
is for um, the central bank to purchase securities uh, and hold them directly. Um, the programs that I was showing you before are, of both, are, are clearly of both types. Now, let me go through each of those in turn, starting with the lender of last resort. Um, so first of all, we, we call this the enhanced lender of last resort. Willem Bowder has written more extensively about this in his own work than we write about it in the report, um, but we do take a lot from what he, what he has done before. Um, the, the enhanced lender of last resort differs from the traditional lender of last resort in two ways. Um, it is wider in the acceptable collateral that accepts and wider ranging in the counterparties with whom it is willing to, uh, to transact. Um, and so that can become complicated for a central bank to, to widen the counterparty, uh, set of counterparties. And it can also become complicated to widen the range of acceptable collateral because they have to be able to price it. So I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, similar, it's similar though to the lender of last resort in a couple of very, very essential ways. So the first one is that the counterparties in our view have to be regulated and supervised to assure solvency. It's extremely important that the central bank never lend to insolvent, known insolvent counterparties, because if it were to lend to those insolvent counterparties, there would be several things that could happen. The worst is, first of all, it makes itself senior to everybody else because it lends secured. And the second one is that if it becomes known that the central bank lends to insolvent counterparties, that this could increase stigma uh, and essentially become a black mark for the counterparty itself. Uh, beyond that, um, the, it's essential that the, that the collateral that's, uh, that's posted face face appropriate ha haircuts relative to quality. Because again, remember, uh, the central bank does not lend to uncollateral. Now, if I look at the market maker, market making is more complicated in, in some ways and easier in others. Um, this is to purchase direct securities directly in illiquid, systemically important markets. It's complicated by the fact that, um, that the central bank has to be able to price the security and it has to be able to offer a security, a, a price that is um, that's attractive when markets are disorderly, but not attractive when markets are functioning or in an orderly way. So this means that the central bank needs, or the market maker of last resort needs an ongoing capacity for pricing securities. Now, central banks do this as part of their collateral framework, but some central banks have wide collateral frameworks like the Euro system, for instance, um, with about 25,000 securities, all of which it prices every day, and, uh, and some which are much narrower, like the, um, like the Federal Reserve System, um, which relies on their existing uh, market prices for securities, at least that's what they state. Um, I think if push comes to shove, they would they do lend to to people uh, based on on collateral that is harder to price. Um, the other thing is that there should be a requirement for sterilization, at least in our view, um, and uh, and that may not always be the case. But the hope is that you can do this without changing the monetary base. Remember, these things are inherently monetary transa policy transactions. If you're not careful. Um, now, it does differ from the enhanced lender of last resort because you really don't care who you're buying from as long as it's as the, as the security settles. The, and, and you can do that with delivery versus payment with DVP uh, so long as the settlement, um, you know, the settlement's going to occur. So, so in, in that sense, the solvency requirement doesn't matter. It doesn't, uh, you know, I, I would be a reasonable counterparty if I own the appropriate security. Uh, I should be able to sell to the central bank just like anybody else. Um, now, choosing among these can be complicated. Um, as we emphasize in the report, we prefer lending. We prefer lending because in the case of lending, private agents are determining prices. And we also have a lot of experience with how to deal with lending and the moral hazard consequences of lending. Um, but this may not always work. And we list six reasons why it might not work. Um, private sector market makers might withdraw and it may be difficult to, to get them back just simply by lending. Typical market participants on the buy side could disappear and offering to um, and, and offering funding through lending again may not be sufficient. The quality of security itself might come into question, but the central bank may decide that the securities market is systemic and therefore wants to bolster the quality assessment and have to buy it. Um, it may not be possible to establish the solvency of potential borrowers. One can certainly imagine that possibility. Um, there could be very com complex private sector counter 
uh, party arrangements that make it difficult to know where the funds are needed and, and made it difficult to do the lending. And finally, if the lending uh, facility is not a standing facility, it might be difficult to set it up quickly, and you may need to do this quickly. Um, so the challenges then, and this is, I, I, will, I will finish here in a moment, um, the, the challenges that the central bank faces for this is, first of all, to decide which markets qualify and which are systemic. Um, this is a very, very difficult question, but one that I think that we should, we should face. Um, is the facility available all the time? Uh, is it a standing facility, just a dormant one that nobody wants to, wants to participate in? Or uh, is it only available under stress? Who should the counterparties be? Um, and that's a very important one. How can we make sure that we mitigate the moral hazard associated with this? Obviously, by offering to provide liquidity in stress circumstances, we're making it, we're subsidizing liquidity in certain states of the world, therefore encouraging um, institutions of various kinds that could potentially borrow or receive some support from the central bank to be uh, to have balance sheets that have less liquidity on them themselves. Is that a good thing or is that something we should really worry about? Finally, how swiftly should the balance sheet expand and how quickly should it be unwound? We close with 10 attributes that we think uh, uh, <coughs> um, or th that we think such a, a framework for market stabilization should have. The first one is true of a basically everything that a central bank does in my view, and that is be transparent and clear about your objectives. That's how you maintain accountability. Um, support only markets that are deemed essential, which of course means deciding which ones they are. Um, we actually think you should create permanent facilities that may be dormant because cranking them up or having people avail themselves of those facilities under stress is something that's far easier. Um, specify the counterparties and the counterparty qualifications in advance, even if they're quite broad. Um, and um, be a quantity taker. This is something that I think is extremely important um, and, uh, and something that, that often has not been done. Set a price and buy at that price, um, but the price should be unattractive in normal times. Um, only intervene in, uh, in when market and funding liquidity is severely impaired. So the, if it is a standing facility, it should be set up, set up so that that intervention really almost never occurs. Um, credibly announce, uh, you want credible announcements of what you're going to do because they could reduce the scale of the required interventions. If you look at the corporate bond purchase facilities of the Federal Reserve, the simple announcement of that clearly uh, brought spreads in and the Fed did go on to make purchases, but it's not exactly clear that they had to do it. Um, be clear about the roles of overlapping and competing authorities. This is more important in some jurisdictions than in, than in others, but it is important to know who's in charge of what um, and exit quickly or at least as quickly as you can. Um, and then with that, I will close and thank you all very much. And I look forward to the discussion. So thank you very much. Stephen, also for being on time. I think that you put a lot of different, let's say, issues and aspects on the table. Now I'm happy to uh, introduce Frank and give the floor to, he, to him to discuss and provide you know, comments on, on these documents. And I'm inviting all the other people that are online that want to ask questions to post the question on the Q&A. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Um, first of all, thanks very much for having Daryl and I here and uh, compliments to Steve and his uh, co-authors because uh, they think it's a very well-timed and provoking paper about both the backstop liquidity and asset purchase questions. Uh, it happens that Daryl and I are engaged in contemporary work on sim similar policy areas. Uh, in that work, we stipulate that lender of last resort operations are the preferred solution but then assume they will not be enough to resolve market failures and mainly focus on official asset purchases. And our view is asset purchases can be conducted by the central bank, by the fiscal authority, or by both, uh, depending on the jurisdiction and circumstances. And it might be best to, to prepare on all fronts. So in terms of discussion topics, I have five topics. Um, first is principles for lent of last resort and market maker of last resort. Should these two principles be developed separately? Is applying Baggett to market maker of last resort seamless? 
So here I'm thinking dysfunction is more idiosyncratic and penalty rates may be more time varying uh, than under a lender of last resort program. Uh, the policy rate is kind of uh, a good benchmark for lender of last resort uh, um, uh, programs, but market rates can be um, much harder to pin down and uh, establish what is a penalty rate at, at various points in time. And this difficulty may um, make a standing asset purchase facility uh, very difficult to do, um, even though it might might seem like an appealing thing. Uh, for, for market maker of last resort, rely solely on central banks or can fiscal authorities or coordinated action between fiscal authorities be optimal? And again, this could vary by uh, by jurisdiction, and there are certain legal issues in some jurisdictions that would make this challenging. Uh, the second is standing or ad hoc facilities. Uh, whether these are standing or discretionary, is that appropriate for lender blast resort, enhanced lender resort, or asset purchases? In reading the paper, I wasn't uh, convinced that there was a consensus among the authors about whether each of these should be standing or discretionary, and, and I think it is a very uh, difficult question to, to uh, get a definitive answer on. Uh, the third area would be communication, distinguish uh, market function purchases from LSAPs. Uh, this is especially important if the stance of policy is not neutral or restrictive. When LSAPs and market function purchases are aligned, it is useful to communicate when market function purchases have ceased or to, you know, to be able to distinguish uh, it as you go, which, which are which. Uh, unwind considerations may be challenging for a central bank um, if time inconsistency or rigid uh, entry and exit uh, criteria are used. Um, fourth is transparency. What are the benefits of credible transparent settings for a discretionary facility? So even if we think a standing asset purchase facility may not be plausible, uh, we do still see benefits to transparency in a discretionary uh, facility. If you are clear and the market could price in this form of liquidity insurance, and it would also get more allocative efficiency. Uh, we were really thinking very much about the treasury market. And if um, even if, a, if, a, if uh, officials want to make this a discretionary program, they can communicate and people could rely on it and it would, it would uh, improve both the pricing of, of the securities at auction and, and the allocation to people who really wanted a safe asset. And then the fifth area would be moral hazard issues, um, expand the regulatory perimeter, group regulation, and, and it does, that that takes time for that to, to transpire, but that would be a very uh, important thing to focus on. Uh, flexible capital arrangements, can you consider counter cyclical capital and liquidity rules? That would um, you know, be helpful to intermediation during stress. And then broad market structure improvements such as expanded central clearing, perhaps growth of all to all trading um, and reduce variability and margin practices uh, to, to limit excess leverage. And that, that's those are the five areas I thought we could think about. And, that, and then I don't know if Daryl has anything that he wants to add. I think, I think Frank covered uh, pretty much everything. I just want to amplify what Frank said on the moral hazard issue, Dan. I think it's consistent with what Steve said. W when you're in the middle of a financial stability crisis, it's too late uh, to address moral hazard by letting the market uh, get yeah, even more unstable. It's too late. The time to address moral hazard is in peacetime when you can uh, improve uh, the structure of markets and regulations so that you mitigate this problem. And that's why Frank and I believe strongly that these uh, market support programs need to be accompanied uh, now with improvements in market structure and regulation that, that mitigate this problem. Also, something that Jeremy Stein has said repeatedly and that Frank and I also say repeatedly in our, in our work on this is that to the extent that uh, you're giving away a put to investors. If it's clear that these market function purchase programs exist, they're going to have to pay for that put when they originally invest in the securities at issuance. And so the government is going to be receiving the value of that put. 
And that mitigates that aspect of the moral hazard problem. Good, so thank you very much. You know, a lot of questions already. I don't know, Steve, do you want to start to address some of the points that has been raised? Just, you know, okay, you're not going to give an answer, but at least uh, your view. And then I will start to collect uh, uh, questions. No, I just, um, let, me, let me just, first of all, let me just thank Frank and, and Daryl for coming um, and, and thank them for their work. Um, I think that we, I think we we basically agree on on all of the big all of the big things. Um, we agree first of all um, on certainly on what you just said, Daryl, um, and what you finished with Frank, which is that um, that one of the things we need to do is make sure that both the markets and the institutions are more resilient, so that the likelihood of having to intervene is lower, um, and that the time to do that is not in the middle of a crisis by letting people fail. Um, that, 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 that creates catastrophes and, and there's a lot, there are a lot of externalities. You, you, don't, want, you don't want there to be, um, the, the consequences of that are, um, are, are obviously uh, something that you don't want to have to face. So that's a, that people who talk about, um, about addressing moral hazard by letting, letting people fail in a crisis, I think are missing. Are, are missing something pretty important, but but it's absolutely the case that we need to figure out ways to improve market structures and improve um, improve institutional institutional resilience. So um, once we get to this, though, then the question is, and I, I think I I, I I certainly agree. Um, we did we didn't mention this in, in any detail, but it's certainly the case that the central bank would not be the purchaser uh, if there are things to be purchased. The fiscal authority can do it. Uh, the example of Sweden comes up right away. It turns out that the Swedish finance ministry actually was the first was the first purchaser in the pandemic, not the not the Riksbank. Um, so you can, you can you can certainly see that. And obviously, um, uh, those of us that 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 know the institutional setup in the United States are are very aware that the Treasury provides indemnification for what it is that the Federal Reserve is doing through the SPDs um, when it's purchasing stuff. So on that, on that, I think it's right, and I think that you you're you put your finger on 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 what it is that we need to think more about the issue of the structure of the asset purchase facilities uh, and their standing nature, and for the lending facilities, how to how to think about the pricing. If the um, if the if there is a, another uh, stress period, so I don't think we have any uh, any disagreements whatsoever. So thank you very much. We have several questions now. Someone very detailed, some other let's say more broad. So let me start from uh, one question that is coming out already uh, in several uh, uh, parts. One is you know. Uh, what is the legal infrastructure? Or what is the type of regulation that you envision that can, you know, be implemented in order to complement or maybe try to reduce moral hazard that the market maker of last resort is going to generate? So who is going to do this? And uh, so who should be in charge? Uh, and I think this is a question that pretty much is coming both is, uh, you know, can be directed both to Stephen and maybe also to Frank and Daryl. So Steve, do you want to start? Um, well, I mean, I, I, I guess I can, I can start because the answer to that is that it's going to depend on the jurisdiction that you're in, what the, what the legal structure is uh, th that you need. Um, Daryl, uh, Daryl has, has suggested um, for the last few years, something that I think many of us uh, support, which is the central clearing of U.S. Treasury securities, uh, something at, at least um, in, in part that comes out of an excellent paper that Frank and his colleague Mike Fleming wrote on, on the, the benefits of, of central clearing for U.S. Treasury securities. Now, is there anyone who can legally mandate the central clearing of U.S. Treasury securities? Um, I don't think in the U.S. there is such an entity. Um, and uh, if there were, I guess I'm not sure it might be a good thing. I, I'd have to think about it, but I'm not sure that we can, um, you know, in, in some instances, we've been able to mandate central clearing. Um, it's done through supervisory and regulatory uh, regulatory rules for counterparties. Uh, but that's about that's about it. You can't you can't. I don't think you can regulate that anybody does this, but I could be wrong. Um, Daryl, you probably know more than Frank. I mean, I could, I could, 
I could say a few words, I guess. Um, so I think you're right. I don't think there is any authority in the U.S. to mandate central security, charge securities. The SEC does have um, a legal theory that they put out a proposed rule and it's it's uh, not been finalized. But I guess their their thought is that they had authority under the Government Securities Act of 1986 to um, mandate uh, the CCP, which they regulate, so that if you're a member of the CCP, they can, that well, this is what the rule's proposing, that the central clearing can be mandated through that channel, because um, they have, you know, in terms of, you know, making the CCP safer uh, by not, you know, they're right now, there's a lot of indirect exposure to the CCP uh, by people who are, you know, members of the CCP, but also have, uh, you know, clearing where they're self-clearing for people who aren't members and then this kind of they're kind of acting as shadow ccps and this this provides an indirect exposure to the to the ccp and the sec is you know coming in through that lens uh there's been a lot of uh, pushback so far so it's hard to predict how this will play out but it, even if it even if central clearing is expanded in the u.s i expect it will take a, a number of years uh, for it to actually be, be put into place. But it is something that's you know, ongoing right now. Yeah, but then I'm sorry, do you think that really this will solve the problem? Uh, you know, that we don't need a market maker last resort if we will have central clearing? Uh, no, it doesn't. I don't think any, uh, you know, there are a number of initiatives and none of them you know, solve the problem alone. Let me, let me, let me just say that, I, I'm sorry, Daryl, I, I do want to know what you think, but I, I just one small comment about that. I don't think that we want a world in which all states of the world are covered by private sector, uh, forms of private sector mechanisms, uh, you know, whether they're insurance or institutions. We, we, we're we okay with some states of the world where uh, where the government where the government has to step in uh, because it's just too expensive otherwise. Okay, yeah, so let I, me take. Uh, I, I, I don't think I don't think it it would ever solve the problem fully. It would it would reduce reduce it. I think. Yeah, no, no, that that's for sure. Uh, you know, then I'm I'm taking also a question from Enrico Perotti that we discuss a lot at the ESRB, and is uh, something that is uh, in a sense uh, uh, trying to address the issue that uh, by creating a standing facility as uh, a market maker or as a resort for uh, private claims would, in a sense, produce the fact of this put that uh, uh, it is difficult to micromanage because we don't know, you know, what is really the right price at, at which uh, uh, the central bank has to intervene and so on. So the question is, are we all making a huge mistake? And maybe we shouldn't even consider this possibility. And if it has been used, it has been completely cancelled out. I'm now trying, you know, maybe to express uh, what Enrico is trying to ask. Uh, well, I think uh, I, I personally agree with Enrico's premise, and I think Frank does as well, that a standing purchase facility is not as effective as a purchase facility that exists programmatically but is not in action all the time. It comes into action uh, when uh, the market instability arises. That said, uh, uh, I think it's more a question of effectiveness than, uh, than the inability of a central bank to price securities. I mean, let's take US treasuries, for example. Maybe it's not a case in all jurisdictions, but I think a central bank can effectively estimate the fair prices of treasury securities during normal times. Uh, and you know, if it, if it put up a standing facility, it could uh, provide a backstop. I just don't think personally that it's a very effective approach. Frank, what do you think? No, I, I agree. I do, I do think, you know, we did look at this a little bit and we, uh, we looked at the, some, a number of measures and, and even um, the treasury market has to be viewed in different sectors. And so what might be a, a penalty rate, let's say, in the, the five to seven year sector of the curve in terms of yield spreads or relative values would not necessarily be the same um, relative price in different parts of the treasury curve. So it, it's, uh, 
I mean, I do think it's it, it's good to be transparent, but to actually have a you know standing facility is as transparent as the discount window may not really be that, that achievable in practice. Um, yeah, can I, can I make a couple of comments? Uh, two, two. So, so the first, the first one is in d direct, direct response to to Enrico is that central banks are already pricing secure massive numbers of securities all the time. So it's important to keep in mind that in the euro system, the collateral framework includes twenty five thousand securities, each one of which is priced daily. Ninety five percent of them, approximately, mark to model not to market because there aren't markets. So central banks, the, there is a there is a pricing machine out there. You can argue with it, you, whether it's any good or whether you like it, that's not the point. The point is that they're doing it. Um, wh what we argue is that the central bank has to have a standing capacity to price securities. The, the Bank of England uh, has a capacity that it developed for pricing corporate bonds. Um, oh, and the, of course, the 25,000 securities that the, that the Euro system is pricing are largely privately issued um, securities. And so it has that mechanism. And as I think as, as Daryl suggested, it's a, it's a, the, this is a machine that prices things in normal times. Um, and so, so it, it's probably appropriate for figuring out what the normal time price is during a during a stress period because that's when you want to buy it. Now, I think that there's a there's a fine line between a dormant facility that is, can be cranked up quickly and a standing facility. Um, and I don't know that any. Uh, I, I think that what Frank, Frank said that he detected a, some possible disagreement among the authors, and, and I think that. That most all of us would have agreed that a dormant facility is certainly fine. You have to have something off the shelf that you can use. And the fact of the matter is that once it's there, everybody's going to know it's there. Don't don't be naive and think that you can keep this somehow hidden in a in a dark room from people. They're going to understand it's there and they're going to understand how it works. And because of that, um, as as you suggested, Daryl, there's going to be pricing from day one. Uh, of these securities based on how that thing works. I don't, I think that there's a small difference between a, a, a standing facility that's really open all the time and that. Um, and, uh, and, and I don't think I would be willing to uh, stake my life on that difference. And if you, if you, if the, if you come to me and say that the first, that the pure standing facility just simply isn't workable, um, then my guess is I'm going to give in pretty fast. Yeah, so you know, there are a lot of questions also in terms of uh, pointing on the fact that clearly devil is in the details. So, for example, there is this question that is asking, you know, do you support the FSP proposal regarding the regulation of non banks' financial intermediaries, including minimum haircuts and initial margins? And then, are, are you considering, you know, non banks also having the possibilities in some sense? Uh, to benefit, so can the central bank go and buy directly also from institutions that are not directly, uh, you know, banks or uh, regulated institutions? I don't know, someone I want to answer this question. You guys want to go? Yeah, please. I mean, I, I, I have an answer that I um... I mean, mine's really quick. The first one is the central bank can buy from, the central bank can buy from anyone. Um, the the issue with the issue with non-bank financial intermediaries um, is with lending, not with buying. Um, and uh, as as long as the purchase, our view at least is as long as the purchase is delivery versus payment, so there's no counterparty risk in the transaction, that it can be with any with any counterparty. Um, will it be with any counterparty? Probably not. Market structures don't work that way, but um, but. But that, that's that, that's fine. As for the issue of uh, of the FSB non-bank financial intermediary um, standards, I mean, I think that we we need to work very hard on on ensuring that those uh, that those people that, that those institutions have um, have sufficient regulate are brought properly inside the regulatory perimeter so that they can't create the kinds of disruptions that they've created in the past. And if that's the case, then they're going to end up um, ultimately with access to the kinds of facilities that we're talking about here. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna maybe take a slightly different uh, attack on that question. Uh, I mean, putting aside the legal authorities, 
which I think are also limited in certain jurisdictions, purchasing any sort of asset is problematic. I mean, Frank and I are focused on the government securities because they're the issue, the issues involved with uh, fiscal uh, versus monetary authorities is, is not uh, a problem. But as far as purchasing any assets, uh, I, I personally have some reservations about the central bank stepping into any asset market. Uh, you know, there are extreme emergencies that are allowed for uh, in U.S. authorities. There's 13.3 and other authorities, but the, it's a slippery slope once you start uh, leaving the government securities market uh, uh, and you try to, quote unquote, support financial stability in other markets, that uh, becomes quite a slippery slope. Yeah, so I don't know, Frank, do you want to add something? Yeah, I th the only thing I was going to add was is in terms of um, the market structure can can limit uh, things. For example, you know, we, we all favor lender of last resort or even possibly enhanced lender of last resort, but it it is, um, you know, we face a certain set of counterparties and if they are balance sheet constrained, even if we uh, provide a lot of liquidity and, and would be uh, would not object if they pass that liquidity on. Sometimes on lending can be uh, stymied by the capacity of the people who are the intermediaries at the central bank. And so people have suggested that we broaden out our counterparties. Um, we have to some extent for the reverse RP, but in terms of on lending emergency liquidity, uh, it, it still is potentially a friction uh, that we have to we have to work through a, a relatively narrow set of uh, counterparties. Yeah, so there is also again uh, an issue regarding how do you implement it, and also how are you going to disinvest then the asset that you buy because you are the market maker of last resort. So uh, how do you address also the moral hazard and stability concern? Uh, that this aspect as well is going to uh, create. So do you have any let me, let me just let me, I want to address something Daryl just said. I, again, um, Daryl, you, you expressed a distaste for the purchase of private sector securities. Um, I may or may not have that same distaste, but the fact is that they're doing it. And so one of the things that we're facing is the question of the fact that they're doing it. Will they stop doing it? I don't know. I think once... Once you start doing stuff like this, um, uh, it's it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to pull back. Um, and as as I was as I pointed out in one of the slides um, in the euro system, they they hold almost 350 billion euros worth of privately issued securities. Um, you may not. I mean, that would be a, that's not a huge amount, but it's not nothing. Um, so it would be a lot if it was my personal wealth, but but it's not a lot for a central bank that has a huge balance sheet, but it's still not nothing. And so I think they're doing it. And there are, are um, a lot of, uh, there, there have been now a number of transactions, you know, and not just the Bank of Japan uh, of, buying, uh, of buying privately issued securities. We can sit here and say that they shouldn't do it, but that I think is, is, is that was not our starting point. Um, uh, for, for what we did. On, on the disinvestment question, um, my own view is that they should disinvest as quickly as they can um, to get the stuff at, off of their balance sheet. Um, I would say that's especially true of the private sector issues where the intervention um, could distort credit allocation pretty seriously. Um, it's also, I believe, true of the, uh, of the sovereigns. Um, there's there's no inherent reason to. I mean, what what the sovereign purchase does is remove duration from the from the market uh, of the, the 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 from the consolidated liabilities of the government. And I don't know why you would want to keep it out. Um, we're we're starting to see the problems caused by that. So again, I would say disinvestment should be should be fast, but there doesn't seem to be any urgency. I think that's unfortunate. I don't know, Frank Darrell, do you want to add? Yeah, I just want to go back to the case study of the Bank of England in September and October of last fall. There, you face the situation where the central bank wanted to tighten its monetary policy, but was forced into the market to support market stability with purchases, the opposite of what um, the Monetary Policy Committee had recommended the day before uh, the crisis occurred. 
And so I think you asked, Loriana, how can you mitigate this problem? Frank and I think that there are cases in which, and jurisdictions in which, as he said, this problem can be mitigated by having the fiscal authority, not the monetary authority, conduct the purchases so that the central bank doesn't have to bend over backwards to say, well, on the one hand, we're tightening, but we're also purchasing. And therefore, we need to sell these purchase securities as quickly as possible to get back to tightening. That's a tension that you know, Andrew Bailey, the head of the Bank of England, uh, dealt with squarely, but maybe there are cases in which you don't need to, uh, to create that tension. Yeah. I don't know, Frank, do you want to add? Yeah, I mean, a, a little bit, I guess, when we thought about the asset purchases by a central bank versus a fiscal authority, we might think the central bank um, has to enter, has to decide, you know, has to start purchasing, has to decide when to stop and then has to unwind, has those three phases. But if a fiscal authority does this, it's this first two phases of the same, but the third phase is more a, you know, just kind of rolls out the maturity of its liabilities if it had to fund, you know, the purchases with short-term debt, and then it would roll them out. So it wouldn't have the unwind phase, it, and, and, and it would also have the advantage of not, you know, interfering with the communication of monetary policy. So, so we do see advantages if it's plausible for fiscal, and it's and uh, and there is also potentially scope, but very much depends on jurisdiction on coordinated action, uh, where uh, where you could have a fiscal authority purchase and some financing arrangements with the central bank to assist. Yeah, so it seems to me that there is a, uh, not a, a significant consensus between uh, Steve and. Uh, Daryl and Frank on uh, you know what type of asset in some sense uh, should be targeted for this money market of last resort, and you know on one side you can think to intervene in market where there is a systemic risk, but then the question is uh, how do you measure or how do you assess that the market is subject to systemic risk? So this is a question for Stephen that uh, several people are asking, uh, or. Uh, you know, are we then limiting just the intervention on the treasury market? So I don't know. This is something that I think we should be clarify a little bit more. I think it's. A, I think that's a very hard one, and I think it's something that, that 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 we need to think about much more. I don't. In the report, we actually don't don't discuss in any detail how to determine which markets are systemic. Um, it, it, it. I mean, obviously, Frank and Daryl have. Have reasonably narrowed the scope of what they're thinking about to sovereign to sovereign markets because I think it's hard to argue that those are not systemic. Those are clearly systemic. The question then is, once you get past that, what else is there? Um, as I suggested, some um, some private some central banks have decided for reasons that of their own that corporate bond markets in some circumstances are also systemic because they're concerned about the um, they're concerned about the funding um, of the of the um, non-financial sector. Um, is that going to be generally true? I don't know. I think that my answer here is that we need to think about that this very, very hard. And I would encourage, um, we still have quite a few people here, many of the names I recognize that are quite knowledgeable. I would encourage us to all think about that and develop a set of, uh, and to sell, develop a set of criteria that is appropriately limited um, for, for that, and then hope that central banks don't get too expansive in what they're doing. I mean, just for the, just for the, for the record, I'm not a big fan of having 25,000 securities in your collateral framework. I understand how it happened in the euro system, uh, but why they've continued to do it after more than 20 years um, seems to me to be to be a bit uh, a, a bit odd, especially when your when your your main operational framework leaned heavily or leans heavily on that collateral framework because that brings immediately brings a large number of um, of private sector securities within your domain and i'm i'm not sure why uh, why you would want to do that yeah but uh, you know this is also referring then to the to the question regarding eligibility list uh, you know in europe ecb is accepting as eligible collateral for uh, getting funding from its in, uh, where, from when it has been uh, let's say set up in 1999 not only treasury is accepting also corporate and uh, and other 
and uh, uh, and you know they were imposing a minimum credit ratings and that's it so you know uh the question is uh, uh are we limiting the market Nicholas resort only to the treasury again or it was a mistake that one of the ECB is accepting all these other assets as eligible. Of course, this is starting another section. I see that uh, you know we are almost out of time, so maybe we need to discuss again and have another meeting. But I think that these are questions that I didn't see a lot of debate about this. I don't know. Someone I want to tell us something about this. Well, I mean, I, I, as I said, I, I understand the historical. Uh, the, the historic, the history and the path dependence of this, but I would have hoped that at some point the the euro system would have said, "Wow, maybe we should narrow the scope of what's what's acceptable um, as collateral." Because I think that the the first step in the in, the, in this is you, you want to start with sovereigns, and then if you absolutely have to, you want to increase, but not unless you not unless you have to, and you have to have good reason uh, good reason for doing it. Um, but okay, so clearly there are other questions, but uh, you know, I, I I try to be on time, and uh, uh, so I want really to thank. I see that already. Darrell clearly he has another meeting. I want to thank uh, uh, first of all Stephen because you know it was uh, fantastic. You have uh, you spent time to present uh, these reports, and I'm sure that you will receive other questions from people uh, on on this topic that uh, I, I'm sure we will talk uh, again. And uh, I want to thank uh, Frank and Darrell for their time. And we are looking forward for your document as well, because uh, clearly we will be very curious to see uh, what is your view on this topic. So, but thank you very much to everybody and also you know, to all the people that participate. And uh, I'm sure that there will be other opportunities to discuss. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks very Bye. much, Frank. And thank Daryl for me as well. Well, thank you, Steve. It was a pleasure talking to you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.